right. Um, and I'm going to kick it over to John. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I've seen many folks before, but uh, my name is John Butterworth. I'm a, a planner with the City of Charleston Planning Department. Been trying to work the last couple of years, at least, mostly on land reuse and delinquent property sort of sort of issues. Um, the uh, the other folks, Crystal Perry's with the City of Huntington. She can introduce herself and her work later. And Kim Reed, uh, likewise, is uh, with the City of Nitro, and she's uh, doing all sorts of uh, things around this issue as well. So you you've got some some really really smart ladies, and then me. So uh, I'm sorry. Um, but we're going to talk about kind of the delinquent tax sale process, uh, mostly in the guise of how you might use it as a way to to get a hold of bad, um, you know, brownfield uh, abandoned or dilapidated structures in your community. And so I think this fits really, really well with the mission of the, the bad buildings program uh, that Nicole uh, and others work on. And uh, and it's, you know, it's one slice of the pie. And, you know, one thing that we've always, I think, uh, tried to emphasize, Crystal, Kim, and I, and anyone else that talks about land reuse in West Virginia, it is but one part of a very large uh, set of solutions that we need to be working on here in West Virginia. So, um, so we'll talk about that. Um, I think all you guys, you know, uh, you know, no community in West Virginia is immune to the problem properties that we're talking about. Um, you know, you've got some of our higher growth communities, um, you know, maybe to a lesser degree, but these sort of problem properties are, 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 you know, ubiquitous in West Virginia because we have experienced population decline. We have an older housing stock and uh, that, that the brunt of all the issues that go along with, with troublesome properties falls directly to local governments. And so if you're a local official, that's you. Um, and your citizens are the folks that, that, that pay that toll. Um, just to give a quick context, I'm pretty sure most folks are probably familiar with it, but a land reuse agency uh, is enabled under West Virginia code uh, to be established by, by cities and counties. Um, and it, it can be multi-jurisdictional right, through, through intergovernmental agreements. But basically it's an entity that, that is very deeply rooted in that community that can deal with, with uh, problem properties. It has wide powers to acquire and dispose of property, um, some very powerful tools for first refusal at certain levels of the tax sale, which we'll talk about. Um, and uh, hopefully that is uh, through the advocacy of folks like Taylor Bennett and the Bennett Properties Coalition, which uh, uh, I know uh, some of you have been around the table for those conversations before. Um, the, I think the, the powers that, that land reuse agencies can wield to help, uh, especially in the tax delinquency process, are, are going to, to get better. And so fingers crossed. Um, so the tax sale process, generally speaking, who has seen this graphic before? Like everybody? No, some people haven't. Uh, yeah, Crystal, Crystal is, is, is keenly, keenly aware of this graphic. And, and Crystal and Kim, you guys jump in at any time, please. I don't you know, mean suck all the air out of this, but the, the, this uh, graphic was specifically developed by the Community Development Hub and the Center for Community Progress um, to try to, uh, <laughs> try to very simply explain uh, the tax sale process in West Virginia. Um, if you are looking at the graphic right now, you can probably tell that it is not simple and the mission was probably not totally accomplished with the graphic, right? It still is very complicated, uh, involves a multitude of steps, but basically the, the process falls into three main buckets, I guess. There's the sheriff's tax sale, which uh, happens in year one. And so let's talk about how that, that beginning happens. Uh, real estate property comes due J July 1 of every year, right? So the sheriff is the, the tax collector for each county. And if you don't pay your bill, tax collector comes knocking uh, figuratively. They send you, uh, you know, certified mail to say you're delinquent. And, um, and if you don't pay your taxes before uh, November, uh, the sheriff will auction off the tax debts that you owe to the county uh, at a tax sale lien. And so basically, why would some crazy person buy your debt? Well, because they stand to financially benefit from that. West Virginia, the way the tax sale is structured, uh, uh, it is, the tax sale system, and I know Crystal will talk more about this later because they, Huntington has 
has tried really hard to, to dampen this effect, but it, it's a lucrative business for people that have money to speculate. And you can make up to 1% interest per month plus $500 for the title search and other fees. And so that is pretty good money. And so this gets treated almost like a financial instrument to, to, to make money rather than uh, a way to fund our local governments and, and deal with delinquency. Um, so year one tax auction happens at the sheriff's sale. If it is sold, there's an, uh, a now an 18 month redemption period at any time you as the owner of that property can redeem, you can pay up and get back in good standing with the, the sheriff and the county. Um, but if the property is not sold at that point, uh, that tax lien enters year two. And uh, sometime in year two, all unsold tax liens will be forwarded to the state auditor's office. The state auditor uh, has a uh, delinquent lands division and uh, they basically sit on it for the next year. Um, and, uh, and at some point they will schedule another tax auction. And so those are properties that, that uh, the, the tax debt was not sold. And so it's still delinquent. It's still, uh, you know, uh, racking up fees and all sorts of stuff for the property owner the whole time. Uh, but when the state auditor's auction rolls around, um, bidders have another opportunity to buy again. But at this point, the minimum bid is no longer the minimum, the, the, the tax due on the property, it's $50. Uh, and that just went up this year from 30. So very small amounts of money can be, uh, uh, you know, handed over for, for the, the tax lien on a piece of property. Um, if you purchase a tax lien at that stage of the game, you can get title to it instead of that 18 month period, which is quite long. Um, you can actually get title to it, to it typically in 90 to 120 days, depending on process serving and all that sort of stuff. Um, if a, a, a debt on a, on a tax delinquent property does not sell at that auction, it becomes what's called a no bid property. And you'll hear us probably use the, that term a few times today. No bid properties are just what they sound like. No one has bid on them. And therefore the tax debt languishes in on this slide, what you would see as this weird spaghetti mess of stuff, which is what we sometimes refer to as property purgatory. Um, now the state auditor is the holder of that tax lien. Do they own the property? No, they, own, they, they are custodian of the tax lien, um, which means the owner of the property is still the person that effectively abandoned it in the first place. And so that is going to yield all sorts of challenges and issues for local governments, neighbors, uh, owners down the block, and, and code enforcement, you name it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the quickest synopsis I could come up with of the tax sale process. It does not cover everything, but we could be here all day if we try. Okay, so I'll pass it off to Kim Reed. She's gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, the process and the relationships that you need to have to uh, participate in the tax sale. Hey everybody, um, I'm Kim Reed, the city planner for Nitro, but I also function as the executive director of the Land Reuse Authority. Uh, we have a, a bit of a hybrid model, so we're a functioning land bank, but we also are doing economic development as part of our model to fund. So, and also address commercial blight in our town, which as a hundred year old town, we have quite a bit of. So with that being said, we got started um, in 2017, or excuse me, 2019, um, in this process to learning about how to be a land bank and write a first refusal. And I got sort of plunged in right before a tax sale. So I got a crash course in how to um, deal with the right of first refusal from the tax delinquency sale. And Nitro is uniquely positioned in two counties. Half is in Putnam and half is in Kanawha. So I also had to do it for both. And Kanawha functions differently than Putnam. Everything goes through the state auditor's office in Putnam County. Everything goes through the county sheriff's office and the courthouse is all um, Kanawha County. So I had two different processes to learn for my one land bank. And so, and they have, you know, different sales that are on the same week, different dates. They sometimes could overlap. It's uh, very stressful to organize both. But that's why I think I'm here today to speak on you, to you about the importance of having um, a collaboration, um, a cooperative agreement. Uh, if your entity's 
that are all involved in this process don't understand the process, uh, your success is unlikely. So first off, the, the, the key factors, the partners that are in play are municipal government, your county sheriff, AKA your tax deputy, your county clerk, that goes from the, the main person working at the front desk who doesn't have any idea who you are or what you do, who is doing the paperwork for you to file a deed. Um, or to transfer a deed or, or sell something. And then um, it also is the records clerk. So you have to call multiple times because you're trying to locate deed information, books, pages, I mean, all of that is within that plus the redemption office, which is who you work with the, the most closely in this whole process. And so the assessor's office comes in the entirety of the process because you're trying to identify what you have. So you're working with the assessor's office, the land value. You're also working with the GIS mapping department because sometimes you'll buy a, a, a ticket and it has a parcel number on it. But when you go to look it up to see where it is, there's no mapping. So you don't even know what you've got. And we have multiple pieces of property in our land bank. We don't even know where they are because they're not mapped. So the relationship with that department is critical. Um, if you have a good rapport, they'll go back and look at the old map for you and tell you where it is. Um, but that's, that's critical to understanding what your land bank possesses, especially when you are doing the right of first refusal tax delinquency sale, right? If you're just accepting properties and letting people donate and buying things, that's that's a different story, but in terms of the, the tax delinquency, um, sometimes it's a dart. <laughs> You're throwing a dart at a board and, and hoping it hits where you want it to hit or, or whatnot. And then the state auditor has uh, a piece of it as well um, at the end, and then also the purgatory, the sold to state properties that John was talking about that uh, we have very little control of in our neighborhoods because State auditor just owns the debt. They don't own the property. So we as a community still have to deal with all of the blight and the property maintenance issues and the tall grass and the squatting and um, the heightened use for nefarious reasons. So my biggest thing that I've always kind of said to Taylor and John and Crystal and like our group of LRA um, that meet monthly is if we're teaching anybody how to become an LRA, what to do with your land bank, please, the first thing we need to tell them is how to get their uh, county entities all on the same page. And I'm not gonna go over my, um, my slide as thoroughly as I had planned because really, truthfully, John just went over that whole process too. So I just wanna focus on how important it is to know what each of these different entities do in the tax sale process and how important it is for each of those entities to understand the land bank, our role, and what it is we do for each other and how we collaborate. Can you hit the next slide, John? Somebody else is driving for me, guys, sorry. But I just, uh, the collaboration is key on this and, and that's, uh, the biggest thing that I can say um, to anyone who's trying to understand the process is that we have to do better on educating from all the way to the top to the bottom and back up to get everybody to understand how their actions or their information affects the other counterparts of this big process of going from um, I'm buying a tax lien to obtaining a deed so that we can go over that whole I mean, it's really 18 months to redeem, but it extends past that. You know, it's a, almost a two year period before, you know, you can really get a deed for these properties. So effectiveness and successfulness are all tied to everybody playing their role in, dis in restoring the dilapidated properties and putting them back into productive use in our communities, right? It's our communities. 
And the big, biggest obstacle to that success is the lack of knowledge and the understanding of the law and the purpose of the land bank. So it's critical that we include these separate but equally important entities and make them aware of our process and goals as the municipal land banks. And each agency has a major impact on that process, even if it's unknown to them. So with that being said, collaboration is key. Thank you all. Okay, I guess this is my part. So um, first I wanna apologize. I'm a little disjointed today. We have major construction going on here at City Hall. And so I have a laptop and two computer screens. So I really don't know where to look. So um, I do apologize for that. But um, I'm Crystal Perry. I manage the uh, Land Reuse Agency for Huntington and I'm also the demolition specialist. So um, the two uh, seats that I sit in overlap um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I thought that I would share with you today is um, a little bit about how Huntington got here and um, what we're doing. And so you're gonna hear the phrase population decline. I think I've already heard that twice from John and Kim. And so that's what happened here in Huntington. We went from um, a city of 80,000 down to below 50,000. Um, and that did several different things. Um, one of the major things, of course, um, is job loss, and that's what created the population decline. Um, Huntington is an industrial city with um, a lot of factories. Um, a lot of families lived here, um, got up to go to work, and walked out their front door and across the street to a factory. And so when those factories closed, um, <clears throat> A lot of people um, just retired and stayed in their homes, and then a lot of people left. So anytime that you have a population decline to that extent, you're going to have um, vacant housing, a lot of vacant housing stock. And so that's what we had here in Huntington. And the housing stock in Huntington, um, it's aging as well. It's 100 plus year old homes everywhere. And so when you have a majority of low income homeowners and you have 100 year old houses, you're going to have to make choices between um, housing renovation, medication, things like that. So we have many different things going on in Huntington. Um, next slide, John, please. This is just an example of one property that we had here in Huntington. Um, and in addition to uh, population, loss, we had absentee homeowners. Um, this property you can see, uh, it was 17 years in the making. In 2000, uh, top left, you can see that somebody had just moved out. The property wasn't in major disrepair. It could have been saved, had a little TLC. Um, this property, like I said, had eight different owners and it was uh, a poster child of the tax sale process. And we started looking into this a little further in 2009 when I came on board with this thing called a land bank. And I was fortunate enough to work in the development and planning office where the demolition was housed. Um, and I wasn't in that position yet, but I started linking the tax sale and these properties together because as soon as we would get the owner, make the notice, the property would flip again. And in Huntington at that current time, we were using 100% federal money to demolish these houses. And I saw a, a comment just come by about historic preservation. And we would have to have all of our demolitions cleared uh, by the Historic Preservation uh, Commission. And this particular property, they did not concur. And so we could have uh, remediated this problem with a couple different things. But at the time, we lacked the capacity and we lacked the funding to be able to do that. So we boarded this property up in hopes that someone would come by, get it from the tax sale, see it for what it was, and rehab it. Well, as you can tell, that never happened. So when I moved into the demolition department um, in about 2015 or 16, I went through the inventory. We had several hundred homes on our inventory and I pulled this one 
and we had a really good conversation with the city and said, this house has sat here for 16 years. Um, we've got a non-concurrence from historic preservation, but it is to the point now to where we're gonna have to do something. And so for the first time, the city of Huntington allocated money for demolition. And we were able to get some of these properties that we had non-concurrence from uh, the historic preservation and we were able to get this down. And you can see in 2017, someone had broken into the property and just had taken anything that was left and had destroyed it. So next slide, please. Um, and <clears throat> again, County and tax sale. That was another contributor to Slum and Blight. But in Huntington, it was a major contributor. And um, we had so many speculators that were coming into Huntington. Um, in 2009, you know, we became a land bank through home rule. Um, and we got backing through a local bank. We got a large uh, line of credit. Um, and we attended the tax sale. It made front page news above the fold, and it said uh, City of Huntington participates in tax sale with $1.5 million. And so we went there to try to scare off the speculators, and it worked for a couple years. Um, but their main goal was to come into Huntington and just buy these properties for the interest. So at the time, it was the highest rate of return on any investment that you could make. It was 18 months. And they would purchase these properties. They would pay pennies on the dollar. They would put someone uh, in it to rent and um, never come back. And when code enforcement or the Unsafe Building Commission would write the citations or identify the property um, as being unsafe, they would just stop paying the taxes on it and the cycle would just continue and continue and continue. Um, if they had cash, they could buy property. Um, there's no checks and balance to the tax sale system now. So you can be the worst landlord um, in the city or in the state, but as long as you have cash and you can pay for those properties on the day of that tax sale, you can buy property. A lot of the speculators um, and a lot of uh, local people knew that the tax sale was a get out of jail free card. And so um, with what we were doing as the city, we were demoing these properties and putting a lien on them. And then they would just quit paying the taxes because they knew that if the city demoed these properties, there would be a lien to follow. And they just quit paying the taxes. And because the city did not have the funds to, um, to protect their interest and to go buy um, that tax ticket before the land bank came. Um, the lien was completely gone. All of that is wiped out through the tax sale system. And the lien followed the property, not the person. <clears throat> so they knew that the lien didn't scare them. Um, it wasn't gonna be on them, it was gonna be on the property. So that was one of the things that we identified was a, a way to capture these properties uh, from that tax sale and the land bank was what we needed because we could go over, we could purchase these properties, um, especially if we were working in certain areas that we were redeveloping. Um, and like I said, we, we caused those speculators to go away for a while, but then they realized that, and, and they really follow uh, land banks, whether you know it or not. And they saw we didn't have then a whole lot of enabling legislation. So they came back. <laughs> Um, and so we're still fighting that battle, but we're getting closer than we were. This is just a few examples of some properties. Um, I think the property on your left, that was a property that was actually occupied. And um, we actually combined forces with our land bank, with our demolition, with um, City Mission, Coalition for the Homeless, and we were able to talk to the property owners, have them donate that property to the land bank, get them fast-tracked uh, with housing through um, Housing Authority, Habitat, City Mission, and we were able to demolish that home. And there's kids actually living in that house in that kind of condition. Um, then we have uh, the middle picture, um, drug paraphernalia. You have squatters that go into these houses. Um, and then the big building there on the right, um, 
this happened to be a property that was being bought on a purchase agreement. Um, and you really couldn't tell that there was anything wrong with this property from the, from the front. And um, then we started noticing some, uh, you know, bricks falling from the side and the fire department uh, ran some uh, drone footage for us and we could see that this was collapsing. And again, the owner <clears throat> threw up his hands and he said, oh, I'm, I don't own that anymore. The state does. I quit paying the taxes on it. So that's, that's kind of what we are dealing with. Um, and so, um, you know, for smaller communities in Huntington, we were fortunate now to have general fund and, and uh, a little bit more resources to deal with problems like this. But for smaller communities, just being able to purchase these for taxes um, has been an issue. So next slide, John, please. So as I said, in 2009, we saw um, you know, what was happening with the tax sale and we decided to form a land bank. We really didn't know what a land bank was, but we decided to be the guinea pigs and uh, we had talked to uh, people from the Centers for Community Progress and I started getting educated. And that was when a few years after um, we started the uh, Abandoned Property Coalition with the Hub, I know Ray's been there from the beginning um, and we kind of all learned together. I think when I first started talking to uh, the people in Charleston and Ray and the hub, I don't think they had a clue what we were talking about or what we wanted to do. But over time, we all, like I said, we were all educated together. Our mission for the land bank was very simple. We were gonna return vacant, abandoned and tax delinquent property back into productive use, period. It was kept as simple as possible. Um, once the process went through the 18 month and we got the, uh, the lien, got the deed to the property, we boarded the properties. We boarded those properties to state code from the inside out. Um, you, I challenge you to get in any property that's boarded uh, by the city of Huntington. So we've got that down pat. We'll be happy to share that with you. Um, we maintain those properties. We keep the grass cut. We keep the trash picked up. Um, we demolish some of those properties. We sell the uh, vacant lots to the adjoining property owners. And then of course we do some rehab. As you can see the bottom left picture, that was a property that we picked up at the tax sale in, um, in an area in Huntington that um, was kind of on the tipping point. It would go up and down and up and down. Um, and so we decided to pick that up and we sold that to a, a private investor that um, has done a lot of work in the city, so we knew his background. He was uh, um, in, good, uh, in good standing with the city, and so you can tell that that was a complete uh, turnaround for that property, and now it is collecting taxes and it's productive. Next slide, please. Another program that we did and we had a lot of success with was the Veteran Initiative with Habitat for Humanity. Um, <clears throat> On the top left slide, you'll see uh, a house that looks like it's in a little jungle. And this was um, on a little street called Bruce Street. And that is, that is what the whole area looked like. I think there was maybe nine houses there just on this little side street. And the director of Habitat came to us in the development and planning office. Again, I'm fortunate to work in a department where a lot, of the, a lot of tools are kind of circling me every day and I can hear what's going on. And so I can jump up and say, hey, can the land bank be involved in that? Um, but Dave wanted to create um, a veteran community of tiny homes. And so he had uh, looked at Bruce Street and he wanted to know how the land bank could help. And so we became partners and we went to the tax sale to the county and the state and we purchased every property that we could get our hands on in Bruce Street. And then we sold those back to Habitat for Humanity for a very small price. Some we donated, um, again, because the land bank is a tool. And if it is used for anything other than a tool, it will not succeed, period. So you can't look at this and say, well, you know, you lost $1,500 by that sale. 
Well, on the surface, yes. But if you look over 10 years of what that's bringing back into your city, then you definitely are uh, not at a loss. Um, and that, that's how we viewed this. So um, we had to demo some properties. And um, uh, today there are, I think, <clears throat> seven new veteran tiny homes there. They're all owned by the uh, owner there. Uh, they pay municipal and refuse to the city. And so they are productive. And now when you drive uh, uh, to Bruce Street, you see a thriving community. So that was definitely a great partnership. We enjoyed that very much. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and the, again, these are just some different things that we've done over the years. Um, I am extremely fortunate, again, of the department that I work in um, and sometimes the administration. If we have an idea, um, a lot of us just do it. Um, one of the things that we did uh, a program was produce peddlers. We partnered with West Virginia State University in the Scratch Project. Um, we um, let them use vacant lots in the city to put community gardens on. Um, and I'll pause here and say community gardens are great, but they have to, you have to make sure they have capacity. You have to make sure they're going to be monitored because you are not going to have time to monitor a community garden because they can get out of hand overnight. So we had uh, capacity. We had people that monitored them and all we had to do was just let them use our lots. And so they grew, um, you know, vegetables and they had um, chickens and they had eggs and they did all kinds of stuff. Flowers, they sold bouquets. But the best thing that they did is they had a group of kids from a local community center that actually were able to make a business plan uh, called Produce Peddlers. They received a grant that they could buy bicycles for the kids and the kids could peddle their produce. And so they were able to, like I said, go uh, start to finish with a business plan and they learned a skill. They learned a little bit about finance. Um, so we loved this um, um, partnership that we had with West Virginia State University. Um, we also partnered with them to do Life on Lots, which is um, sort of the top middle picture. We had a vacant lot, and this was a street behind Bruce Street where the Veterans Community Center or Veterans um, Houses are, and it is also right beside a community center. And so this project cost us nothing. It was a partnership with a local church, and we had some pallets donated, and we built a bench. And we took the pallets and broke them down and put them on the fence. And the kids came in and painted those up like the spines of books. And this was like a little reading corner, a reading nook, a little reading garden for the kids at the community center. And um, that, that was fantastic. We had kids there all the time at this, uh, at this little um, vacant lot. Eventually, this lot sold to uh, a business that was uh, right near them. But in the meantime, uh, it was being uh, used for something creative. And then another, and the last one that we did was our installation. We took a vacant building that had already been boarded by the city. We purchased this on the tax sale. It's the lower right picture. Um, we wanted to reduce the appearance of vacancy. And that was one of our goals. And we thought, how can we reduce the appearance of vacancy? And so um, I found this idea. None of this i None of this is original. I take credit for stealing other people's ideas. Um, I got this from Detroit. Um, we measured um, the um, areas of the windows that were already boarded. We had um, plywood donated. And we took these just vacant boards, these um, boards that had nothing on them, and we took them to the community center and asked them to paint and decorate boards for um, Martin Luther King Day and that we were gonna put them up on a house that they could walk by every single day. And so the kids um, designed and painted all of the boards that are on there. And this became known as our dream house. And the kids actually wrote their dreams on the front door. And um, on Martin Luther King Day, as you can see, our mayor came out and we unveiled all of the um, art that the kids did. And, and I could honestly say with this house, um, when we left that day, I was like, give it two days and all this is going to have graffiti on it. But, you know, it, it is what it is. It was a great day. We had a good time. 
And until the day that that house or that building was demolished, it was never had one piece of graffiti on it. And we received calls immediately of the neighbors thanking us and talking about how cool it was. Nobody wrote mm-hmm. over anything that was on that property. So that was that was probably the best one that we did. Next slide, please. And um, I say this all the time, if you've heard me speak before, you know I talk about our toolbox and how Huntington now has a garage. We, we recognized early on in the beginning that um, we needed to take inventory of the tools that Huntington had. Um, I'm a very much a person that asks, well, why can't we do this? Or why are we doing this? Um, So I need to know, you know, why haven't we done this? I don't care to try something. I don't care to try something new. If it fails, we can say, hey, been there, done that, didn't work for us. But we took inventory of what we had here in Huntington. And the only way that you're going to pull this stuff off and be successful is teamwork. Um, Your land bank cannot be the end all to uh, slum and blight elimination. It's going to take every tool that you had. And as you can see, we have um, our building inspectors are fantastic. Um, they, the good thing about all of us here in Huntington is we are all on the same page. There is no ego at all. And I can call my building inspector and say, hey, will you go look at that? And within the next day, he's out looking at this property for us. Our code enforcement, we have a vacant property register. Um, We rely heavily on our local delegates. We talk to them every year and they'll say, give us a list, tell us what you need. But honestly, um, you gotta have funding. And Kim and I and John, we've all talked about this, is land banks are great, but they, um, you can't do them without any money. They're very expensive. Just the upkeep on the property is extremely expensive. So one of the things, this is the best thing we did was we sat down and we wrote down every tool that we had. What can your legal department do? We're getting, we're actually uh, starting um, our planning sessions now. We've had two meetings. We need to sit down with legal and say, we need to start, um, liens are not working. So what do we do now? And, And everything comes with a cost. Um, there's not capacity to do everything. So we have to get creative and and find out, okay, if we start to file judgments, who are we going to use? Who can we pull in as a partner? So the main thing is definitely look at what tools you have. I would imagine that you have probably tools out there that you don't even know you have. Um, But that was a big one, is looking at your toolbox. Next slide, please. And so... um, To end it, we wanted to end on a positive note. And I always say that uh, in Huntington, we don't want to be the biggest slumlord, um, but we can't sit back and do nothing. And so I was looking through quotes the other day and I saw this and I thought it really summed up what those of us that are in blight and um, blight elimination and working with vacant dilapidated housing I think we need to get this on a t-shirt. There are risks and costs to action, but there are far less than the long range risk of comfortable inaction. And so I think that a lot of people, a lot of the, um, the bad partners or the bad people have been very comfortable because they know um, that the city for years um, has done sometimes the bare minimum. And that is because that's the only thing they've been able to do or that's all that they thought they could do. Again, it all goes back to capacity and funding. But good leaders are willing to make people uncomfortable. And that's what we have to start doing. We've got to make people a little bit uncomfortable so that they will know, oh, the city of Huntington, they demolished 104 houses in eight months. They mean business. I probably need to do something with this property. Change is hard, but necessary. We've got to create this change. Otherwise, this is where we're gonna be and we won't have anybody else to blame but ourselves. No good deed goes unpunished. When you start working in this field, you are gonna see this every single day. 
And Kim Reed, I think is a perfect example of this. She works so, so hard. She is a one woman show and she gets beat every day. And I think she would shake her head in agreement with that. She has had a rough, rough road to walk. Um, but this is why we put on um, uh, conferences and seminars and summits like this, is to educate those of you who are doing what we're doing. Because when you are around a, um, a community member or a delegate, and they start to talk about vacant abandoned houses, and they say something that it's not necessarily the way it is, you can say, oh, no, no, wait, wait. I remember that Kim Reed and John Butterworth said this, and let me tell you how that really works. So on a positive note, I will end to say, go forth and educate. The more that we can educate and the more that uh, we can get people to understand what we're trying to do, the city doesn't want to be the biggest property owner. We don't want this property. We want to move it fast, but we've got to act in some way. So go forth, educate, and uh, keep up the good work because we're getting there. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, John, Kim, and Crystal. Um, it was very informative and now I'm sure that every single one of us that watched us are all experts on the tax sale process now um, and can go share all the information with everybody. Um, I wanted to um, open up a little bit of time for questions since this isn't a very large group. If you have a question and are comfortable enough asking, um, you can unmute yourself and ask it or drop it down in the chat. Nicole, yes. sitting here in Mannington, um, with our two buildings, they're, they're owned by the individuals, but they're of course on back taxes. Is there a way that we can go to those individuals and say, would you just maybe hand those buildings over to us? Or is, is that a method? I mean, can we do that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll chime yeah, in. And Kim, <laughs> yeah, Kim, Kim and Crystal, please do so. But, you know, so Charleston, we're, 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 we're tiny little infants compared to the work that Crystal has been doing. And Kim's been doing it longer than, than we have here in Charleston too. But our, some of our earliest successes here in Charleston were just donations. You know, we, we, we reached out to a property owner and they said, I, I just don't want it anymore. I don't know what to do with it. And, and, and in some ways they're just looking for it out. And the, the trouble with the tax sale process is that for far too long now, it's been at least perceived to be an out. But even though that person says, oh, I quit paying the taxes, I don't own it anymore. They do. Right. They still own it, right? And and actually, the cleanest way for you to get title to that property is just to have them sign it over. So that's absolutely worth an ask. Yeah. Okay. So so you can do that legally as a city. As city. long as you can accept the donation, like we are, as a land bank, obviously, you know, we are a five hundred one c three. We can accept and and they can actually use it as a tax write off. Which we, unlike John, when he started, that they got a few properties by doing the voluntary donation. We have not been successful in Nitro in getting anybody to donate their property and, and or sh uh, share a clean title. But we currently are in the process right now with a tax speculator on that very topic, trying to get them to donate. So we are now getting to dip our toe into that because you know they've let it go it's been an un un unimproved property for 10 years so we're yeah, trying I, to force the hand with liens and um, force the hand sounds cruel but you know what i mean if you're not going to do something you know you've been on the vacant property I, for five years <laughs> yeah i hate prospectors i i think there's a special place for those folks man um but John, back to back to you. So you're a city. So your city did that because we don't have a land bank currently. So you you probably you probably want to get some legal advice, but cities okay. cities can accept donations. The difference okay. that I think you'll find is that um, because of, of procurement and disposition of property rules, disposing of the property for the city is going to be more difficult. Whereas LRAs have a much more flexible process to dispose of the property. But um, I think accepting it would probably be fine. And now, if you guys decide in some some you know 
uh, distant or near future to, to create an LRA, the city can transfer it, uh, the property to the LRA for it just with an act of order. Yeah. That, that's the main reason, one of the main reasons why we chose the land bank, because like John said, the city can't buy or sell property, but they can accept donation. And that was where a land bank come into play. Um, as an example, we had a gentleman that had um, three property, two properties that was demolished by the city. Um, they had liens on them. He passed away. He had uh, three sit three children that came in uh, between municipal refuse and um, demolition. It was almost up to a hundred thousand um, dollars. And uh, we told them if you'll donate all of the, you know, if you'll donate those three properties to our land bank, then we can dismiss um, all of the municipal refuse and everything that's on there. So um, we accepted that into our land bank, but there are times I get calls every day from people wanting to donate properties and, um, you know, you just can't take everything. So you have to really know the areas that you're working in. You have to get that um, because you'll, again, you'll find yourself as the per, you know, the city doesn't want to be the biggest property owner. Right, right. We, well, we're a small, small little town, so we're not quite, we're not even half of, of the size of Huntington. So we, we do know where our problems lie, but, uh, and it's, it's always financial. And we do have quite a few um, LLCs coming into our area and buying up property. I'm thinking it's because we, we're having some oil and gas um, action in our area. And I think that they, they think that, you know, we're just going to boom soon. But it's it, the houses that they're buying are the houses that are the most deplorable. <laughs> so and then they just then it just ties us up. How Laura? big is your community, Laura? How many how many residents do you have? We have about 1,200. Well, just to give you some context, Charleston and Huntington. We have about two thousand. Sorry, Charleston and Huntington are huge, right? They have right. a much different situation than perhaps right. you and I do. Uh, the city right. of Nitro has six thousand residents, and I realize that's more, but it's still less than the Huntington yeah. and Charleston. So, just to give you an idea, we have a small land bank of five appointed um, members, and okay. so we started small. So it, it is possible for a small community to band together and make that impact as long as they have the support of their municipal government. Okay. And their Laura, in the near term, if you've got a building commission or a local EDA or somebody else that could accept the conveyance of that property, that keeps it out of the city's books and, and gets it out of that, what John was referring to, where the city may or may not have the ability to reutilize mm -hmm. that and, and move the property on. but. Mm -hmm. uh, an EDA or a building commission or any kind of quasi-governmental underneath the city's auspices could have more flexibility. Okay, we do have a building commission. So that building commission could work as our land grant or land bank or not, no. Well, in order in order to have the 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 powers assigned to LRAs under state code, you would, I think, have to, to have it enabled it under ordinance uh, or constitute under ordinance as a state, as an LRA. Um, okay. I think that there had, well, so Kim can speak to the, the, there for at least a period of time, they were a joint LRA EDA. Um, we still are. Oh, still are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're a hybrid. We're trying to accomplish um, blight dilapidation through ta tax delinquency and, and land banking and holding property and trying to put it into productive reuse either through private uh, a private person you know an entity buying the property from us or uh, the city investing themselves and revitalizing potential spots uh, mostly commercial honestly from that angle for the EDA but we are attempting. I know that I hear Crystal in the back of my mind every day <laughs> when it comes to that. You can't do both and you can't, um, if, even if you lose money on a property, if it's going to go back into productive reuse, it's important. So the good news and the flip side to that is, for the time being at least, we have a very accepting 
um, city council and a very supportive city council and a very um, visionary, you know, um, the mayor is very supportive of the plight and the vision of the land bank. So for right now, they're going to fund us until we can figure something else out. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we definitely are throwing everything we got at it because my favorite thing, and it actually tied into what Crystal was saying a little bit ago, is the city doesn't want to be the biggest landowner. I don't want to be a realtor. Right. I don't want the city doesn't want to sell real estate. But if private development was going to come in and they were going to take care of these problems, especially in our commercial areas, and they would have already done that. And so when after years and years of, of buildings looking like they're gonna fall in on themselves, the city is obligated to do something. And so we've put our money where our mouth is and we've had a couple successful um, transactions and selling land bank properties. And I mean, right now we're getting ready to buy two more properties and we're gonna demo some more properties and we're gonna create more opportunities for new development in our city that private investors were not doing. Right. Well, we're, we're just kind of starting, starting on this little voyage. So um, Kim, I might just be calling you on the phone one day and chatting you up. We'll do it. I get calls all the time from smaller cities like us that have talked to Crystal. They've talked to John and they're like, listen, I'm not a Huntington and I'm not a and I'm not a Charleston and I'm like but you could be a nitro because we're small and we are one people show so yeah definitely right. I can help anybody who needs help or has questions um I can actually drop my contact information in the chat okay thanks one of the, one of the other things I'd offer just in that same vein um uh I've had some conversations with one of the staffers from Princeton and they're you know a smaller place and, you know, he was asking some of the similar questions of, you know, it's a small town, getting people to even serve on boards is sometimes like pulling teeth and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And, and much like, you know, and I think he talked to Kim and, you know, and that sort of stuff, but having, having your EDA gavel in as the EDA and then do that business and then, you know, adjourn and then gavel in as the, the LRA, you know, I, I don't think there's any reason you couldn't do that. And, and, you know, it really depends on the priorities in your community. For for Kim and Nitro, those those go hand in glove. So right. absolutely, you know. Whereas here in Charleston, you know, our 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 LRA is really trying to deal more with the residential side of stuff. And so we've got a URA, and I know Crystal can speak to that. Theirs is maybe technically a sub program of their URA or whatever. So you know, there are so many different ways to skin the cat here. Um, it really just has to work for you guys, but, but uh, Ray's suggestion is a really good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you got to make a near term action, Laura, that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. The LRA can definitely be something in the future, but if you need to do a near term action, the building commission might be the best group to sort of accept that conveyance. And then you figure out okay. what to do from there, if that's really what you want to do. Just a, a quick comment on what why an LRA might be interesting in the longer run is that a you have right of first refusal right now at the sheriff's tax sale process so that's that's a, a a potential avenue to like we were talking about today to use the tax sale process and the LRA's ability to be first in line to maybe acquire something that that you really need to to make a difference. The other thing is that is that LRAs could and we've we've yet to do this but um through their tax exempt uh status they can basically through a lease purchase agreement provide some incentives to reduce tax burden for up to five years for a, a private party buyer so um that's a little carrot you know local governments have so few carrots to offer you know to to make make good on on investment but that does seem to be one that's in there right now Yeah, and the right of first refusal is really important that we utilize it. Um, me and John are the only ones, to my knowledge, that have used it. And if we don't use it, we'll lose it. And the problem is with not using it is you have to figure out, you have to navigate it. You have to figure out how it works for you. You have to find the funding source. You have to, and that's just all after you've created your entity. I mean, that, you know, you have to make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And 
we fought really hard for it not to sunset and then to get a five-year extension and to give us more opportunities and a higher threshold if if more LRAs are not created and more of these communities are not using this tool it will go away eventually because the speculation will overshine what the municipal land banks are trying to do um would it are there if if there are other questions be happy to entertain them at this point but i i just i guess one i want to pose a question to the group is is everyone familiar with the west virginia property viewer tool <laughs> yes i love that thing. okay good good so i think the one the one thing that it, it, it have you found the delinquent property box yes okay good yeah so that, that i i guess one of, just to share charleston's perspective one of the, one of the things that um that we've been sorry guys um, accidentally doing the screen share and I didn't mean to. Um, using, using that tool uh, to be able to find what's in the hands of the state auditor. And uh, because many communities haven't dealt with those no bid, you know, property purgatory sort of properties ever, there's a huge backlog of them. And your community, you know, may have lots of ones that you either through a building commission or a city entity or an LRA or, or an EDA could go in there and be a, a purchaser of those for as little as 50 bucks. Now you have to do title work and there's there's other things involved, but but that that's a that's a huge tool. And the state auditor, that's less than a year old now that that they have been making that information available. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning at the state auditor level, because it was it was on it was on the news, at least here in Charleston. So I think I can say it is that uh, uh, JB McCuskey is auditor and Russ Rollison is the the deputy. Uh, auditor for delinquent land sales, um, they they I think have very big plans to to uh, do significant revision of the tax sale process. So um, I I think that for localities this is going to be a step in the right direction for um, giving folks in, in all our positions the ability to to grasp back that property when the 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 private sector has really just you know abandoned it you know for all intents and purposes. So, All right. If Thank any, you, everyone. Oh, sorry. I was about to um, ask if it was okay um, if you guys, Kim already did, drop your contact information. If people do want to reach out to you guys after, um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel here in the next few weeks. And um, this is also our last installment of our monthly webinar series for 2021. Um, we will kick off again in January, 2022. So just keep an eye out um, for information about those coming out. Um, and I believe that is it. Um, oh, also Carrie um, did make a note in the um, chat to not take a property without a phase one environmental site assessment first. Um, so if you're thinking about taking on a property, um, just maybe double check and call the Northern Brownsville Assistance Center and we can get all of that squared away and checked out for you guys. All right, once again, I want to thank um, all of our speakers today and I will look forward to you guys seeing you guys soon. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Yeah.